Dr. Nardell is a pulmonologist with a special interest in tuberculosis. He trained in pulmonary medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital with additional research training at Boston University School of Medicine. While at Boston City Hospital, Dr. Nardell became the director of tuberculosis control for the city of Boston. In 1981, he became chief of pulmonary medicine and director of tuberculosis control for the city of Cambridge, positions that he held until 2005. His principal academic appointment is as Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School with secondary parallel appointments in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine and Harvard School of Public Health. In the early 1980s, Dr. Nardell was also appointed Medical Director of Tuberculosis Control for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, a position that he held for 18 years. Dr. Nardell is currently conducting a research project in South Africa studying the transmission of MDR-TB using large number of guinea pigs to quantify the infectiousness of MDR-TB patients and the effectiveness of various control interventions, including ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. It is uh, my pleasure now to turn you over to Dr. Edward Nardell. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, today's topic, as Evgeny said, was um, germ is germicidal UV air disinfection to prevent airborne respiratory infections. And uh, it's going to be a rather in-depth presentation. I think probably the, the most um, detailed presentation that I've done in, in such a setting. It's based on a presentation I did for NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, which has funded a good deal of my research. Uh, let me just move ahead here. And, um, you know, I should probably begin by asking why uh, upper room germicidal UV. And I think I've shown this slide before, but it is my concept of hospitals as drug-resistant TB factories, where people come, uh, in many cases, without tuberculosis and end up leaving with tuberculosis, or in some cases, uh, enter the hospital with drug-susceptible TB or no TB at all and leave with uh, drug-resistant uh, TB. Um, I'm looking for my arrow here. Oh, yeah. Thank you. OK. So yes, I just want to be able to use this arrow. So patients basically entering with, that, with drug susceptible TB and no TB at all and leaving with either uh, TB or drug resistant TB. Um, as you know, there are a number of uh, control measures that uh, can be done. And we've talked about probably the most important one being administrative controls. And by that, I mean in particular, um, active case finding, early diagnosis, rapid diagnosis, and effective treatment. And I spent a whole hour on that topic. Uh, the last time we talked about other interventions, building design, uh, use of respirators, et cetera. And this time, we will focus in depth on one form of air disinfection. Why am I doing this? The reason I'm doing this is that in many parts of the world, although Natural ventilation, open windows and doors, uh, is by far the most available and uh, sometimes uh, the uh, most effective forms of air disinfection. Uh, even in those settings, uh, sometimes at night, sometimes in cold weather, uh, the um, windows and doors are closed. And in parts of the world, like uh, Eastern Europe, um, it really isn't a practical solution for much of the year. Um, and therefore, we have to look for other means. When we think about those other means, there are usually mechanical ventilation, there are air filtration machines that are available, and there's upper room germicidal UV. And there's no doubt uh, in my mind that of the three, the most cost effective is upper room germicidal UV if it's properly done. And the same, of course, the properly done comment goes well with uh, mechanical ventilation and uh, air filtration devices as well. So um, let me move along. Um, we're going to be talking about 
uh, tuberculosis, of course, but I thought I'd show you just one slide from the 1957-58 study of the Livermore VA Hospital in California. Um, this was not a planned study. Upper room germicidal UV was in use at that time. It's a very old technology, as I'll show you. And it so happened that an influenza epidemic went through. And it turned out that the wards that had UV installed, let me just get the pointer here, the, the wards that had UV installed had uh, 209 people at risk, and only four got influenza, a rate of 1.9%. The wards that had no UV, there were almost 400 people at risk, 75 got influenza for a risk of 18.9%. This was, UV was 90% effective in protecting patients in that case. This is surprising, and the reference is here, by the way. This is surprising because we tend to think of influenza as droplet spread, um, form of contact spread. But in fact, in this case, um, this is one of the instances where we think that there's evidence of airborne spread as well. Now, this slide is really not, in, this was more intended for NIOSH, but let me just mention again that if we think of TB infection control and all the organizations that we're involved in, including GHD Online, um, a lot of the things that we're involved here at Harvard are related. We have the design an engineering course that won't be held this year, but has been held for the last six years. We're working with a group to do, put some online recommendations for building um, that's designed for health. We hope to get a lot of names on online of, of consultants. And we've talked about the, um, the uh, FAST initiatives, uh, that is, finding cases actively. And among that work is, is some research by NIOSH looking at novel uh, interventions, and that's uh, some of the things I'll be telling you about today. Lots of different ways. I mentioned that this is an old technology. Here is a textbook from 1946 by Matthew Lukish on the applications of germicidal erythemal and infrared energy. So this uh, technology is uh, almost 70 years old, I would say. Uh, it preceded this book, but um, it's, it's been around for a long time. Now, we're going to talk about a study we've done in South Africa. Um, and, and the reason I will go in that in detail, I think I've shown it to you before, is that we're basing some new dosing guidelines on that. And uh, we'll talk about safety and new approaches to upper room germicidal UV, which we find very promising. Again, this may be more detailed than some of you need or want. Uh, and uh, I'm not apologizing for that. Uh, if uh, you uh, find this too much, um, uh, you can you know, come back to it if you need it. It'll be on file. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, stick with me. First of all, there is a NIOSH document in 2009, which are the basic upper room germicidal guidelines for healthcare settings. They're, they're, they were very complete at the time in 2009 in terms of references. But as you'll see, I think we still didn't have very good dosing guidelines. How much UV do you put in a room? How do you decide? And that's part of what we'll be talking about today. So what's in those NIOSH guidelines is the results of some studies that NIOSH funded uh, in Colorado, which found that in a single plane um, in the upper room, they had an average of 30 to 50 microwatts and achieved about 16 air changes in that room using organisms as the test organisms. And the problem with this average dose is there's really no way to, no, no standard way to measure that and, um, and really hard to predict in advance of actually putting up the fixtures. So this is a target uh, for irradiance in a horizontal plane uh, and NIOSH was recommending because that experiment showed good efficacy that if you achieve this average in a single plane, perhaps you would achieve good efficacy as well. The other dosing guideline was to use 6.3 watts total UV lamp per cubic meter in the, in the room. And that, again, is based on that experiment. And that had to do with UV watts, and I'll explain that. 
but it doesn't deal with how much UV comes out of the fixture. It tells you how much UV is generated by the lamp. It doesn't tell you how much came out of the fixture, and that is really important. So we need better guidance, and that is the had been the focus of a Fogarty grant that we had here in Boston, and and the focus of some of our NIOSH research, and also our um, Fogarty current Fogarty work. So I'd like to take you back to 1976. Dr. Richard Riley, who was my mentor in this area, was at Johns Hopkins University. And in his office on a Saturday morning, he installed or had installed a single 17-watt lamp. And this on this graph is the disappearance rate of aerosolized BCG organisms. These are test organisms. You know what BCG is. It's a vaccine strain. It's thought to be safe to be around. And you could aerosolize it. He did this with a famous uh, microbiologist by the name of Gardner Middlebrook. And here's the disappearance rate using air sampling of organisms in that room with nothing on, just infiltration of air and die away of the organisms. So that disappearance rate was equivalent to two room air changes per hour. Two room air changes per hour is not very much ventilation. It's probably average for an unventilated room if it's not well sealed. And this room was, this study was done in winter uh, in 1974. And uh, that's the disappearance rate of the organisms. Turn on that one fixture in the room, no fans, just a radiator heating that room. And this is the disappearance rate in the room with that UV going on in the upper room. Air mixing was accomplished in that room simply by convection, warm air going up, cooler air coming down. And that difference is equivalent to adding, um, this dif disappearance rate is the equivalent of 12 air changes. So the one single 17 watt fixture added the equivalent of 10 air changes between um, no, air, no UV and UV. So from that point on, Dr. Riley suggested that if 17 watts added 10 air changes per hour, maybe twice that, or about 30 watts, in that 200 square foot office might add the equivalent of about 20 air changes. And 20 air changes is a really good number to keep in mind. That's a quite useful amount of, of air disinfection. With mechanical ventilation, as you know, for isolation rooms, we only ask for 12 air changes, and that's a lot. Six is even a lot. So 20 air changes is, is quite a bit. And, and one 17 watt fixture added 10, 30 watts he had hoped would add uh, maybe 20. Now, it, it actually doesn't really follow that doubling the irradiation doubles the effect, because it's also dependent on how much air mixing there is in that room. But nonetheless, this is the dosing formula that we've used for the last um, 30, 40 years. And I'm going to tell you, unfortunately, that it's not a very good one either. So we've heard about the NIOSH dosing formula, which is relatively recent, based on a room study. And now I'm taking you back to the original uh, dosing study that, um, that we've used by, by Richard Riley. And I'm telling you that isn't particularly good either. Why not? Well, the fixture used in that study wasn't very well characterized. We didn't know how much UV was coming out of it. We knew how much electricity was going into it. Um, we didn't know how much UV was coming out of it. We have no idea how much air mixing there was. It was presumably good air mixing because of how good the effect was, but it wasn't characterized. So I think I've actually summarized these, um, these um, comments already. And I'd like to um, ask you to respond to this questionnaire. The Riley dosing guideline is limited because, which is true, specifying 30 watts input power says nothing about UV fixture output. Distribution of the UV was not characterized. Air mixing was not assured. Double, doubling UV power does not necessarily mean effectiveness doubles. All are true or no vote.
Okay, so um, hmm. in fact, all are true. And I realize that this is a fairly technical uh, matter that we're dealing with. But if one is going to use UV, upper room UV, you want to use it effectively. And unfortunately, it's, it's necessary to come to grips with uh, some issues like how many fixtures you need in a room. And that's what we're talking about in terms of dosing guidelines. So again, um, in the Riley dosing formula, they specify 130 watt fixture. You can go online and find a number of different fixtures available, and they'll have a certain number of lamps in them. And you can get 30, 40, or whatever wattage is available from that manufacturer. But it doesn't tell you how much fixture comes, how much UV comes out of that fixture. It tells you how much electricity is going in. And the distribution of UV uh, also was not characterized. Air mixing was not assured. And again, doubling the results from a 17 watt fixture doesn't necessarily mean twice the effect. So again, just to hammer those points home. Um, Rod Escom and his group working in Lima, Peru, did the first hospital study of upper room UV using the same technology that I've been using in South Africa and I'll be telling you about, using hundreds of, of, of guinea pigs to breathe the air and comparing the difference in infection rate with UV on versus a, uh, uh, an air cleaning device using uh, ionizers and nothing at all. So this is the survival and 100% survival. And with nothing on at all, these guinea pigs would be um, dying off because of tuberculosis. Um, the ionizing um, intervention was somewhat effective. But the most effective means of protecting the guinea pigs was, in fact, upper room UV. They recorded a um, efficacy of 72% for the UV upper room. And if you correct this for some technical um, details, um, the fact that maybe some of the guinea pigs were infected more than once and you can't measure that, it comes out to closer to 80% efficacy, which is going to be exactly the same as I'll show you for the studies we've done. Now, um, this is um, a, a very important study. and a, contains a huge amount of work. But we don't know terribly much about the output of those fixtures either. We know the electricity that went into them. We don't know about as much about what the output was. So in terms of basing dosing guidelines on this important study, it's also difficult to know exactly what caused this remarkably good efficacy. Now, fast forward, I've shown you this before. This is our Airborne Infection Research Facility in South Africa, co-sponsored by CDC, uh, a South African organization, and, and Harvard uh, School of Public Health. And we've been working there since 2005. Lots of people involved in these studies, and I won't go through all the names, and, 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 and quite a few sources of funding over the years that we've been working there. Now, um, just to rehash, we have uh, six patient beds. We have a um, adjacent in this area that's shown blank in the clinical area are these uh, two chambers that contain hundreds of cages of guinea pigs. I've shown you this on previous days. For those of you who weren't here for those talks, this is our facility, so-called Airborne Infection Research Facility, or Air Facility. Now. In the rooms, air enters the room from a duct in the ceiling. And what we've done is lower the um, exhaust areas so that the air that is being sampled is coming from closer to the breathing zone, either for patients lying on beds or, or healthcare workers walking in that room. So we're not sampling up here. We're sampling down here. This is a, um, a typical wall fixture. We had two of these fixtures in each room. Uh, one on each wall across from each other, uh, staggered a bit. And we had a typical paddle fan to assure good air mixing. This is in each of the three patient rooms and the corridor. Now, this is a key concept. As I mentioned, there are uh, six patient rooms. 
and we put patients in those rooms who are just starting on therapy. And the on even days, the air goes to this guinea pig colony. And on odd days, it goes to these guinea pig colony. And these are not just four guinea pigs. There were, in fact, 90 guinea pigs in each of those chambers. And then each month, we test the guinea pigs to see if they're infected. Um, the difference is that the UV in the room is turned on every other day. So these guinea pigs only breathe the air on the days that the UV is on. And these guinea pigs only breathe the air when the UV is off. This every other day plan allows us to be sure that the patients are equally infectious uh, on the days that the UV is on and off. At the end of three months or four months, we can look at how many guinea pigs are infected in each room. And that difference is the impact or the efficacy of UVGI. This is exactly what Rod Escom did in Peru. And we, we're, we're doing it here in South Africa. So here are the results of those studies. I, I've shown this briefly um, last week. Uh, in the intervention room, in the first study, after four months, we had no infections in the days when the UV was on. And in the control rooms, we had nine. Now, we ran into Christmas here in South Africa. And patients often go home, um, um, amazingly. So we didn't think that this was convincing. And so we did another study in the new year. And this time, we had more infectious patients. And this time, over a period of three months, we had 15 um, patients infected. And in the control room, 48. If we put all this together, we end up with a hazard ratio of about five. In other words, you were five times more likely, if you were a guinea pig, um, breathing air uh, in the, off the ward to get infected on the days when the UV was off compared to the days that UV was on. That correlates to an efficacy actually closer to 80%. Uh, and is equivalent of adding about 24 uh, air changes to the room. Again, remember the number that we talked about earlier when Riley's study equivalent of about 20 air changes is very good. So this, this, this is quite useful air disinfection. Now, the difference between this study and Riley's study, and even Rod Escom's study, is that we've had the opportunity to go back and really look at the details of what we have did there. And we will uh, get into uh, that in a moment. I'm going to um, uh, ask you a question, though, first. So <clears throat> the alternating day study design assured, and which of these answers is false? As much as possible, patients were as infectious during control and experimental UVGI periods uh, is based on the knowledge that individual patients vary greatly in infectiousness. Um, differences between the two groups could be due to the weather on different days. So uh, obviously, all of you got this uh, correct. And um, it is true, however, that um, uh, so the false answer is that the, the differences between the groups. Actually, you, you guys, um, I, I think I didn't ask the question correctly, because I said, which is false? Uh, and actually, one is not false. One is quite true, that as much as possible, uh, patients were as infectious during control and experimental periods. And, and that's why we alternate back and forth. And then the UV. Uh, caused a difference, but the patients were equally infectious. That's why we alternate back and forth. The the correct answer, uh, and don't worry about this, it, it, it's a bad question, I guess. Differences between the two groups could be due to the weather on different days. That's the incorrect answer, and that's what I was looking for. The other two are correct. Uh, at any rate, not a big deal. So. We uh, feel that this study um, is a very good basis for some new dosing guidelines. We've worked with Riley's guidelines for a very long time. We found problems with the NIOSH guideline in terms of trying to predict those averages. And we think we can, we can use these guidelines as um, this, this study to, to develop new guidelines. So we, why? Well, as it, with ESCOM study, we had real patients. 
we had a biological endpoint infection, which is better than just collecting viable organisms. We the key factors the key factors involved uh, were measured or estimated. We knew how much UV was in the room, not only what the wattage of the fixtures was, but exactly how much UV was coming out of those fixtures. We measured lower room levels for safety. We had a pretty good idea of the air mixing, and I'll talk to you about that. And we knew about the ventilation rates in the room. Finally, we have a tool called Visual UV, which is a computed assisted design program, which is free, available free. And I can answer questions about that later, which allows you to fully characterize the UV irradiance. It's called fluency rate throughout the room. So we knew everything we need. This is actually a computer generated picture. And these clouds, if you will, of that are colored red and green and gray are different intensities of, of UV that this program, Visual, can calculate. So here's one fixture on this wall. And there's another fixture over here on this wall. And they're both putting out UV. And, and in some places, they overlap. And you have much more intensity. Other areas, they don't. And all this is in a study that is listed here on the, uh, up in the upper corner. Um, and a, a company called Acuity Lighting allowed us to use their visible light program and adapt it to UVGI, and we're grateful for that. And the hope was that we'd learn a lot more about applying UV by using this computer program. Now, in order to use visual, you need to know exactly how much UV comes out of the fixture. And this picture is not very good, and I apologize for that. But on the end of this long arm, this is a huge room. And this is a very long arm. This arm is maybe six feet long. And at the end of it, you can't see, is a, is a UV meter. And in the middle is this fixture, a UV fixture. And this arm rotates around the fixture, measuring output in all directions. This is called uh, gonio radiometry. Um, it's done only in a few lighting laboratories around the world, including one in South Africa that we've used. And this is a picture from that lab, Dr. Lushner's laboratory in Pretoria. And it allows us to know exactly how much UV is coming out of that fixture and in what direction it's coming out. Gonio radiometry. Why is that important? Well, that program I showed you requires that the fixtures be characterized. This is another approach. This is Dr. Lushner, by the way. And this is an integrating sphere. In it, you can hang a lamp. You see here a, uh, let me get my arrow. You see here a fluorescent lamp being suspended. And this clam shell closes with nobody in it. And the light is on. And the light is reflected all through the sphere and is measured by a UV meter. It's another way of determining how much energy or light comes out of a fixture. This one is called a total integrating sphere. It's also useful for uh, measuring how much UV comes out of a fixture. I told you this was going to be a detailed talk. Now, in a paper uh, that was published a number of years ago, Dr. Rudnick here at School of Public Health and FIRST outlined the fundamental factors affecting upper room germicidal irradiation. There's part one and there's part two. And I've listed them here. Number one is UV fluency rate exactly how much UV is coming out of the fixtures. And if there's more than one fixture, we don't call it irradiance. We call it fluency for the entire room. So here's the, how much is coming out of the fixture. Two is the room air mixing uh, depicted by this fan. And three is the mean UV ray length. And this is an important concept. Here we have a room depicted that is oblong. Some rooms are square. Some are all oblong. Some are many other shapes. If we look at fixture A on this wall, putting out UV across the room, you see that the distance that it travels is roughly twice as long as if we put a fixture on wall B, and it goes across the wall here. It turns out that the UV rays, photons of UV energy, are active as long as they are uh, freely uh, crossing the air until they hit something. They could hit the opposite wall. They could hit the ceiling. 
Um, but until they hit something, they're effective. So in essence, despite, however much UV comes out of this fixture, and it's the same fixture, you're going to get twice as much killing with fixture A as you are with fixture B because the rays travel longer. So UV ray length is important. Now, we don't always have a choice where we put the fixtures. Sometimes there might be windows on this wall and no, no availability of wall space on this wall, I mean, and you have to put it on the wall with a shorter ray length. That may be so, but it should influence the number of fixtures that are required because it's not the same to put the fixture on this wall versus this wall. This is the preferred wall to have longer ray length rather than shorter ray length. So which is false about UVGI? So this time I'll emphasize again, I'm looking for the wrong answer. UV rays are effective in rooms until they are absorbed by walls, ceilings, or other objects. Positioning fixture to allow the longest UV ray length in general provides the most germicidal effect for rooms. UVGI fixtures mounted in the center of the room provided the av longest average ray length. We were all correct that uh, third answer actually is a fairly recent insight. You know, we've used um, center-mounted UV fixtures thinking how wonderful to put the fixture in the middle. It's sort of right in the center of things and all the room is covered. But in fact, you, you have shorter uh, ray length when you do that. And it may be the best place in some settings to amount of fixture, but in fact, uh, taking into consideration uh, the longest ray length would suggest that, generally speaking, center room fixtures are not as good as wall-mounted fixtures. OK, so based on the study in South Africa, and I'm going to tell you what some numbers we got, and again, go back to this if you need them. but. Um, you, um, uh, you, you certainly don't have to remember these numbers. So the average whole room fluency rate was approximately 20 microwatts per centimeter squared, uh, which is much lower than the 30 to 50 um, watts that um, Miller recorded in a single horizontal plane. but Remember, we're taking all of the room, not just the uh, not just the uh, single plane. And I actually want to come back to this figure later. Um, in terms of the fixtures, we use two different fixtures because we didn't want to be testing any one manufacturer's fixtures. And using that gonio radiometry or that integrating sphere I showed you. We, f we learned that fixture A, one manufacturer's fixture, put out 0.22 watts of total UV output. Remember, again, this probably is a 30 or 25, 30 watt fixture. But it, in fact, this one's even higher. But it's only putting out a very small fraction of that wattage as UV. Fixture B put out twice as much. And one of the things we've learned in recent years is that all fixtures are not the same. Some fixtures put out much more UV, sometimes for much less uh, power, as I'll show you in a minute. In other words, their efficiency varies dramatically. And we really need to pay attention to that. Although the UV lamps don't use that much electricity, when you have a whole building uh, run by UV, you want to have this fixture compared to that fixture. So. Um, the total fixture output was approximately 17 milliwatts per meter squared of total ream volume. And we'll come back to that as well. We don't really have a measure of average ray length, uh, and we're working on that. Um, we do know that the uh, a lot about the room air mixing. The fans were running uh, about 100 RPM, and they generated uh, about 50 air changes or turnovers between the upper and lower room per hour, and uh, 57. And we had them set going upward. It doesn't really matter whether they're going up or down. 
in the winter, one might want to run them upward so that people don't feel the draft. In the summer, it may be more comfortable to have them downward. It, they work equally well both ways. I'll come back to these numbers. So here we have a whole bunch of dosing criteria. And it's a bit of a review. In Riley's study, we used 30 watts electricity going into the fixture per 200 square feet. Doesn't take into consideration how much is coming out. Uh, it doesn't take into consideration how much is coming out of the fixture. In the NIOSH study, they had two guidelines. One of them said 30 to 50 microwatts in the upper room. Again, hard to predict in advance and, and no standard measuring method. Another guideline they gave was 6.3 UV watts. Again, that's how much UV is being generated by the lamp. It doesn't take into consideration the fixture efficiency, how much is coming out of the fixture. In our facility, we've said that there's an average of 17 or 20 microwatts per, um, uh, for the entire, entire room. And um, that requires radiometry and uh, 17 uh, total UV watts per, um, that's the total output of the fixtures. Uh, I, I have a feeling that, I, that this number is, is wrong, and I'm going to tell you that, uh, I'll tell you what that number should be when we come back to it. So, next fixture thing has to do with the fixtures. Pictured here, on a relatively low ceiling in a hospital in South Africa is a fixture designed with very wide space, space lubricant. It happens to be set in the middle of the room. And you can see that there are some folded lamps here. This puts out an enormous amount of UV. Uh, but the patients were complaining, and the nurses were complaining about eye irritation. Um, there are no UV standards or fixtures. There's no international guidelines. And some fixtures may are effective or may be effective like this one, but unsafe. And some fixtures are safe but ineffective. So we need to come up with some performance guidelines for fixtures that manufacturers can follow and be sure that they're getting something that is both safe and effective. And we have a little bit of funding from USAID to do that. And we're going to have a meeting in South Africa in July and another one in India in September talking about international uh, standards for UV fixtures. Now, here you have a number of commonly available fixtures. I'm not going to mention names. And uh, in fact, it was Dr. Riley and I in 1992 who suggested that we use these, these uh, tightly louvered fixtures so that we would keep the UV out of the lower room with modern lower ceilings. But the result of them, the, what look like a stack of records, is very little efficiency. So one manufacturer's fixtures sometimes only generate as UV, um, not even 1% of the electricity that goes into these fixtures comes out as UV. Another manufacturer uh, is 10 times more efficient. 6% of the um, electricity coming out as UV. And again, I'm not mentioning names, but that is an important uh, difference. So again, just to uh, emphasize this point, and you can see what a, what a modern fixture looks like. Here it is opened up for cleaning. And in this case, you have a, hard, you have a, a linear lamp, a single tube, a, a parabolic reflector behind that tube. And then when this is closed, you have those louvers that the light has to get through. That assures, that blocks all the light that's going down and make sure, or, or up, and make sure that what gets into the room is pretty horizontal. But it, it, it accounts for an awful lot of inefficiency. So again, the two fixtures we used in South Africa, not wanting to test any one manufacturer's fixture, one of them had 110 watts going in and produced only 0.22 watts of UV output. That's the 0.6% um, efficiency. And uh, another had only 25 watt, roughly, and produced 0.49 watts. So a much more efficient, actually, close to six ti uh, 10 times more efficient. I've made that point already. 
is there a more efficient way to use upper room UVGI? Well, on one of my travels to Russia, I was spent a long time in the one of the airports in Moscow, and I was looking at the upper uh, the ceiling, and you'll find this in many airports if you look up, because they have very large spaces to cover. There's pipes up there, and they use what's called an egg crate ceiling. You can't see it here yet, but it's it's perforated. It's 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 um, like a box that you might put eggs in, and that's why it's called egg crate. And here's an illustration of a perforated ceiling. In this case, we have a fan above the ceiling. It could also be below. And now we've put essentially a bare bulb UV lamp. Ideally, it would have a parabolic reflector behind it to generate UV in the upper room and ask the egg crate, this grid, to keep the UV out of the lower room. What we're doing here is not interfering too much with air mixing. But we're allowing the UV to go into the room without those louvers. So we're taking full advantage after, uh, of the uh, UV that comes out of the fixture. So here's a better picture of our setup in our test chamber. Here you see the egg crate ceiling. Here a traditional lamp with the UV being caught up in these louvers. And here what we tested there was a bare bulb on a plate. We now are more commonly using uh, UV fixture on the wall without the louvers to generate UV in the upper room. So we have we have this test chamber here at, uh, in Boston at Harvard where we put up fixtures, we aerosolize organisms from in that room, and then we do some collecting. And what we've shown in a paper that is cited here uh, is that this upper room egg crate system works really well and much more efficiently than you using fixtures with louvers. And this just depicts uh, how much more efficiency in terms of equivalent air changes versus um, this inactivation rate. Uh, equivalent air changes is probably the best way. Here is for conventional UV units and here with the uh, egg crate UV. And you can see we can, and this is with one lamp or two lamps, we, we really get much more. We're talking about equivalent air changes not in the 10 to 20 range, but in the 60 to 70 range. Now, this will vary from application to application and, and test system to test system, but it, it basically says this is a good way to do it. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this. We did learn that if you aerosolize uh, UV in the middle of the room and have a fan here, you may get a distortion of the results. We really need to aerosolize somewhere else other than right under the fan. Now, in terms of safety, um, the standard is uh, we have to keep patients from getting um, more than 6 millijoules per centimeter square uh, exposure over an eight-hour period. And if there were continuous exposure, if this person were staring at that fixture for eight hours, that would translate to 0.2 microwatts. Of course, nobody stares at the fixture for eight hours. And therefore, the uh, intensity can be quite a bit higher than 0.2. In South Africa, they've been using 0.4. I think that's even conservative. 0.6 would probably be OK. And all of that would result in a real exposure that is still under six, micro, uh, six millijoules per centimeter squared. And I'll show you that. So again, the, the notion here is to have intense UV above the, in the upper room, and to keep UV that bounces off the ceiling or comes directly low, either by the egg crate screen that we just showed you, or by louvers on the fixtures. And as I pointed out, the egg crate seems to be much more efficient. It's not commercially available yet, but it, it, it certainly is uh, available to be used. Um, uh, it's hard to see these numbers, and I apologize for that. But in, in, in using a personal monitor, uh, what you see here uh, with these patients were wearing a personal monitor, and office workers and kitchen workers in different settings, and we measured how much UV they got. And the highest number you'll see here is 33 point something. What that is, it's a pr percentage of the daily 
threshold limit value, that six millijoules. So again, people in rooms, turning around, walking, uh, are getting a small fraction of the UV that uh, we think they're getting if we just use a meter directly aimed at the fixture. And, and so these fixtures are quite safe. And occasionally, we do get eye exposure, as I showed you in South Africa. And usually means a poorly designed fixture or poorly installed fixture. Now, it turns out this is a, um, I'm pointing here, this, this is a UV detector. And if you have UVGI, it's important that you purchase a UV detector uh, to monitor uh, the effectiveness of the fixtures and to know when to change the lamps. Uh, Dr. Volchenkov in Russia changes the lamps after they have declined by, um, uh, I believe it was a third. It could be two thirds. I'll have to check that with him. But at any rate, uh, after he notices a decline, uh, probably by a third, he's re ready to change the, or two thirds, uh, the, change the lamps. Turns out that to mimic the fact that the eye protects, is protected by your head, the shape of your head, the original the guidelines indicate that there should be a sleeve on the detector. So you don't get all of the UV that comes from the ceiling, but only that that can penetrate deeper into this little uh, device here that keeps the UV out of the detector. And you hold this horizontally to mimic, to, to, to mimic the uh, eye and see how much irradiation is getting there. Small detail. And what we've done is show that um, uh, there is um, that, 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 that using that allows for additional safety. Finally, I just want to mention a new development that's on the horizon, not here yet. What you're looking at here is an LED UV. You're all familiar with LED flashlights and LED lights. Visible light is, is there. They're cheap. They last a long time. Importantly, they can run on a battery. Or on solar power, they use very little. Um, well, they use DC current, and it's not difficult. L UV LED is coming along. The power is not great yet, and they're very expensive. But when they do develop, when they are available, they will uh, revolutionize. I think how we do UV. And here's just a, a concept of what I think could happen. Here we have an egg crate ceiling. And what I've depicted is a number of these LED UV um, uh, diodes spaced at different places. And here I imagine generating a beam of LED UV into the upper room, disinfecting the air very evenly over the with very few, few hot spots to worry about. So that's just a concept. And I think you know, eventually, the nice thing about this in high burden settings is that you could run these things probably on solar power in, in sunny places and also um, on batteries if there is an outage. The last slide is just a, a number of the publications that we've had on, on UV over the years. And I, um, I, I refer you to them if you want any more detail. So that is um, the bulk of the hour. And we have some questions uh, that I will talk to in the uh, time that uh, we have. OK, first question. Although the lamp states it is 9 watts, um, or what every wattage lamp is used, only about 30% of the total power is converted to UV. Um, should this not be clarified as total output wattage? Uh, yes, it, it is true. About a third of the nominal wattage. So if you buy a, fic, a, a lamp from a catalog and it says it's a 30 watt lamp, you can assume that about 10 UV watts comes out of that. That's normal. That's the loss of energy that it happens in, a, in converting electricity to UV. That doesn't tell you what comes out of the fixture. So even more important than that conversion, which is always reliably about a third, is to know what comes out of the fixture. And I've shown you that that can vary dramatically. Regarding maintenance and cleaning, how long are the UV bulbs uh, inside the source generally effective before they need to be changed? The manufacturers will tell you about a year. 
but again, of continuous usage, they tend to deteriorate if they're turned off and on frequently. What Grigory Volchenkov has done, he doesn't want to change all the lamps in his uh, dispensary uh, on an annual basis, so he meters them in a very reproducible way using an IV pole to position the meter you know, some distance from the center of the fixture. He gets these numbers on a regular basis, and when the output has declined by a, uh, a approximately, I think, two-thirds, um, he changes the lamps. Uh, Gregory can correct me, uh, and uh, we can, uh, but it, 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 at some point he will correct it. So he's not waiting for them to burn out, uh, and he's not changing them when they're just down by a third. That happens very quickly. I, I think it's uh, two-thirds that he uses to, to change the lamps. Uh, how des desirable is the presence of a reflective surface behind the UV lamp if UV loses its effectiveness once it hits the surface? Well, that it loses effectiveness if it hits a surface, surface and is absorbed. If it is reflected and UV reflects very well, it does not become ineffective. So a good reflector behind a UV lamp, particularly a linear bulb, is highly effective in capturing the UV that would otherwise be lost. Some fixtures are inefficient because they don't have a good reflector. Some fixtures are inefficient because they use a compact fluorescent tube, which is much harder to use as a point source. So um, will these open UVs not and not will be the will these be open UV GIs and not the shielded ones? Above the egg crate that's correct. We're using UVGI either open or with just a parabolic reflector and no louvers, and we're using the egg crate ceiling as the barrier in terms of keeping the, the stray UV out of the lower room. Should UVGI be placed over doors and windows at 2.5 meters? Uh, they should be placed on walls um, that will give you the longest ray length and we usually use them of, uh, uh, at about um, uh, 2.1 meter or two, 2 meters or above. Um, 2.5 is very good if you have the ceiling height above them. Um, but minimum, I would say, is 2 to 2.1 meters uh, above. So we, we don't want to get direct any direct UV uh, sight lines in the room. We, we clean them with 70% alcohol or with a clean lint cloth if UV is turned off for an hour. That, that's quite correct. I didn't get into maintenance, but 70% uh, alcohol is what's recommended. Uh, if you use water or soap, you get streaking. Uh, should, UVs should not be used where glazed tiles are there. You can get reflection off of glazed tiles or many other surfaces, including curtain rods, etc. So you have to check with a meter and sometimes adjustments have to be made. I finally want to go back to the, the, the number that I gave you, which I thought was wrong. And I think we did correct that. In fact, we just talked about it yesterday. When we went back to visual and actually asked our, um, our um, consultant to calculate it, it's actually a much lower number that I told you. For the entire room, the average flux in the room, the average UV radiance is actually in the, in the uh, it's about seven uh, microwatts per centimeter squared. Um, that's for the entire room, and we think that's a useful number because the bigger the room, the bigger the volume, the more UV you'll need to produce that. Visual takes into consideration ray length, and that's why we like it as a gold standard for uh, dosing. But we realize that most people won't have that available, so. The recommendation we're making is that if you put 15 to 20 microwatt output from a fixture in a room and arrange those lamps to give you the longest ray length, we think that you will have the best dosing you can. And I don't know if I can go back quickly in the last minute that is here to the slide. Um, Ken is going to do that for me. I want to go back to the table of, of guidelines that I had, and I can I can back up here just a bit really quickly. So I just want to, yep, here it is. Um, this, this number um, 
is, is not correct. This should be 7 uh, microwatts per centimeter squared for the whole room. But this number, um, 17, so 15 to 20, total watt, again, one fixture produced about a half a watt, the best fixture we had. Um, and we want this, um, we want to put about 17 microwatts, microwatts, microwatts for each cubic meter of room volume, 17 to 20 microwatts per se. That means in our, in our rooms, we had two fixtures, one not very efficient, one very efficient. But I think if you use that as a guideline, that would be good. To use this, you know, need to know how much UV is coming out of fixture. And we, we're, we're going to ask manufacturers to provide that information. I know I'm over. Thank you so much, Dr. Nardell, and thank you so much for our wonderful participants today and for great questions. As always, the copy of the recording will be available on the